This LOS is calculate and interpret yield measures for fixed rate bonds, floating rate notes, and money market instruments. Prices and yields, conventions for quotes and calculations. Yield measures for fixed rate bonds. For bonds maturing in more than one year, investors want an annualized and compounded yield to maturity. Money market rates on instruments maturing in one year or less typically are annualized but not compounded. An effective annual rate has a periodicity of one because there is just one compounding period in the year. An annual rate having a periodicity of two is known as a semi-annual bond basis yield or semi-annual bond equivalent yield. Therefore, a semi-annual bond basis yield is the yield per semi-annual period times two. It is important to remember that semi-annual bond basis yield and yield per semi-annual period have different meanings. For example, if a bond yield is 2% per semi-annual period, its annual yield is 4% when stated on a semi-annual bond basis. Prices and yields, conventions for quotes and calculations. So in this slide, we're looking at the yield measures for fixed rate bonds, and there's two formulas on this slide that have to be memorized, but we're gonna do two practice questions using both these formulas in the next four slides, okay? So the first formula is the bond equivalent yield of an annual pay bond, and the formula is two times big brackets, one plus the yield on an annual pay bond to the power of one half, minus one, okay? The second formula is the yield on an annual pay basis, and it's calculated as big bracket, one plus the bond equivalent basis divided by two to the power of two, minus one. Again, we're gonna use these two formulas in the next two practice questions over the next four slides. The first practice question, if the yield to maturity on an annual pay bond is 7.75%, the bond equivalent yield is closest to A, 7.61%, B, 7.9%, or C, 8.05%. Okay, the correct answer is A, it's looking for the bond equivalent yield, and the bond equivalent yield is two times big bracket, one plus the yield on an annual pay bond to the power of one half, minus one, okay? So let's just bring up the calculator and work through the keystrokes. So we're going to do 1.0775 y to the x, 0.5 equals minus one equals times two equals, we've got 0 0.076054, which is uh, 7.61, Correct answer is A, and there's only one answer that's less than 7.75%, okay? So that's uh, just a formula that you need to memorize the bond equivalent yield of an annual pay bond. The next practice question, the yield of a US bond issue quoted on a bond equivalent basis is 6.8%. The yield to maturity on an annual pay basis is closest to A, 6.69%, B, 6.92%, or C, 14.06%. So this question is looking for the yield to maturity on an annual pay basis, and the formula is big brackets, one plus the bond equivalent basis divided by two to the power of two minus one. Okay, so if we bring up the calculator just to work our way through this, the keystrokes, so you can see the bond equivalent basis is 6.8%, so that would be 0 0.068, and we're gonna divide it by two, and then we're gonna hit plus one, and then we're gonna do y to the x two, and then we're gonna minus the one, and we've got 0 0.069156, so you can see that's 6.92%. The correct answer is B, and note I put in bold here, the yield on an annual pay basis is always greater than the yield on a bond equivalent basis, because of compounding. So we knew A had to be correct. Only one answer looks right if you know that the yield on an annual pay is greater than the bond equivalent yield, okay? Sometimes it's good just to practice one more time. So let's do another one. An annual pay bond has a yield of maturity of 5%. The bond equivalent yield of the annual pay bond is closest to A, 4.94%, B, 5%, or C, 5.06%. Okay, the correct answer here is A, 4.94%, and 
and you don't even need to do the calculation if you know the rule that the yield on an annual pay is greater than the bond equivalent yield. So you see sometimes on the CFA exam, some of the questions, if you know the rules, you're really strong with the theory, you don't even need to do the calculations, okay? So if you're up to speed on this, you'd look at slam dunk. It's got to be A, 4.94%. It can't be B, and it can't be C. Uh, nevertheless, let's bring up the calculator and do the work. The bond equivalent yield of an annual pay bond is two times one plus the yield on an annual pay bond to the power of one half minus one. So let's just bring up the calculator here. So we're going to do uh, 1.05 y to the x 0.5. Okay. And that's going to be minus one. And then we're going to multiply that by two and we get 0.04939, which is closest to a 4.94%, okay? Nice little question. Again, I threw that one in just to show you that sometimes on the exam, uh, if you're really paying attention and reading the care, uh, question carefully and looking at the, the uh, solutions, uh, one answer, only one answer is right. In this case, you don't even need to do the calculation. Nevertheless, better safe than sorry. That's not a 90 second question if you're up to speed on the formula. So continuing with yield measures for fixed rate bonds, the next formula we're going to look at is the effective annual rate. And this formula is not new to us. We've seen this in a couple of different places throughout the CFA level one curriculum, uh, in particular back in the quants. So the uh, formula for effective annual rate is one plus R divided by M and M is the number of compounding periods. Okay. Uh, to the power of MN. And N, as you recall, is the number of years, okay? And uh, so this comes back in fixed income uh, because an important tool used in fixed income analysis is to convert an annual yield from one periodicity to another. These are called periodicity or compounding conversions. A general formula to convert an annual percentage rate for M periods per year, denoted APRM, to an annual percentage rate for n periods per year is the following. So we've got this formula, how we're going to convert um, the, uh, the uh, yields, okay? So it's 1 plus APRM divided by M to the power of M equals 1 plus APRN divided by N to the power of N. So we're going we're gonna, to uh, solve for one of the variables, okay? So we're going to work through an example on this slide and the next. It starts here, but then it carries on to the next slide. So for example, suppose that a three-year 5% semi-annual coupon payment corporate bond is priced at 104 per 100 of par value. Its yield to maturity is 3.582% quoted on a semi-annual bond basis for a periodicity of two, okay? So that's 0 0.01791 times two equals 0 0.03582. So we're continuing with that same bond. Uh, to compare this bond with others, an analyst converts this annualized yield to maturity to quarterly compounding, okay? So we know that the 3.582 was on a semi-annual. Now we wanna convert it to a quarterly compounding. So this entails using the equation to convert from a periodicity of M equals two to N equals four, okay? So you can see uh, we're solving for the APR four in this case. And when we do that, we're gonna get APR four equals 0.03566. So we'll work through the math, don't worry, in, a, uh, in uh, two slides from now uh, for the full uh, solving of that. Uh, on this one, I just wanna show you uh, just very quickly the solution. So an annual yield to maturity of 3.582% for semi-annual compounding provides the same rate of return as annual yields of 3.566% for quarterly, okay? Okay, so we're gonna work through the math on the next slide in, in total detail, but uh, on this slide, we're gonna compare the yields for different periodicities. So we have two bonds, we have bond A and we have bond B. So we have the annual coupon rate, bond A, 8%, bond B, 12%. The coupon payment frequency, bond A is semi-annually and bond B is quarterly. So we're gonna, we, there's different periodicity, so we're gonna have to compare these. We have the same years to maturity, five years and five years. The price per 100 of par value, bond A is 90, bond B is 105. The current yield on bond A, 8.889%, 8 
and on bond B, 11.429%. And the yield to maturity on bond A, 10.63%, and bond B, 10.696%. So how do we compare these two? Because they have different periodicity. One is semi-annually, one is uh, paying uh, coupons quarterly. So the yield to maturity of bond A is of 10.63% uh, is an annual rate for compounding semi-annually, and the yield to maturity of bond B of 10.696% is an annual rate for compounding quarterly. So how do we compare them? So number one, what we're going to do with bond A is we're going to calculate the um, rate uh, based on a quarterly compounding. So again, we're going to use that formula, 1 plus 0 0.1063 divided by 2 to the power of 2 equals 1 plus, we're going to solve for the APR 4 divided by 4. And so what we're getting is 0 0.10492 or 10.492 percent, okay? Similarly, for bond B, we're going to solve for APR 2. So it's 1 plus 0 0.10696 divided by 4 to the power of 4 equals 1 plus APR 2 divided by 2 to the power of 2, and we get 0 0.10839. So it says here the additional compensation for the greater risk in bond B is 20.9 basis points uh, when the yields are stated on a semi-annual basis. So you can see that's the 10.839 minus the 10.63 because that's the semi-annual basis, okay? So you're comparing that to that when it's uh, on a when they're on a semi-annual basis, but it's uh, if we look at the 10.696 versus the uh, 10.492, when it's on a quarterly compounding, we can see the additional compensation of uh, 20.4 basis points. Now, don't worry. On the next slide, I'm going to have the math uh, fully broken down for you, for those of you that uh, are not as strong in math. Okay, on this slide, I'm just walking through all the math, all the steps uh, for bond A to calculate for a periodicity of four and for bond B to calculate for a periodicity of two, okay? Uh, some of you may recall that I never finished high school math, so when I did the CFA level one, sometimes these calculations were a bit of a struggle. I know there's others that are out there. Um, you know, you see the formula and then they jump right down to APR 4 equals 0.10492 and sometimes it takes you, a uh, if you're not strong with your algebra, a little bit of time to decipher uh, what the exact steps are. So anyhow, let's just walk through this quickly. That's for those of you like me who didn't uh, do very well in math. Okay, so we know we're going to start with the formula that uh, bond A had a, a semi-annual yield of uh, 0.1063. So it's 1 plus 0.1063 divided by 2 to the power of 2 equals 1 plus APR 4 divided by 4 to the power of 4, okay? So let's just start on the left-hand side. We're going to do 0 0.1063. We're going to divide that by 2, and we're going to plus the 1, and we're going to do y to the x to the power of 2, okay? So now we've got on the left-hand side, 1.109125, 1.10912, okay? Right-hand side we haven't touched yet equals 1 plus APR 4 divided by 4 to the power of 4. So what we need to do is get rid of this to the power of 4. So on the left-hand side, we're going to now y to the x to the power of 0.25, okay? And that's maybe one of the steps where if you're not strong in math, uh, people could get stuck on. So now I'm just going to hit y to the x 0.25. To five, and I'm going to hit equals, and I've got 1.026231, okay? So now I've got uh, 1.026321 uh, um, uh, equals 1 plus APR 4 over 4. So now I can subtract the, um, I can move the 1 from the right-hand side to the left, so I can subtract 1, and I've got 0 0.026231, okay? Equals APR 4 over 4. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to simply now, APR 4, I'm going to multiply that by 4. And ta-da, I've got my point 1.104924, okay? Again, uh, you can work through, I won't do it for the right-hand side, but uh, a little bit of math help for you, though. You're going to convert that bond B to a periodicity of 2. Just work through the same steps. Now we're moving on to yield measures for floating rate notes. Floating rate notes are very different from a fixed rate bond. The interest payments on a floating rate note, which often is called a floater or an FRN, are not fixed. 
With a traditional fixed income security, interest rate volatility affects the price because the future cash flows are constant. With a floating rate note, interest rate volatility affects future interest payments. So uh, for example, a four-year French floating rate note pays three-month Euribor, which is the Euro interbank offered rate, an index produced by the European Banking Federation, plus 1.25%. Remember that spread is always fixed. It's the, it's the uh, base rate uh, fluctuating that affects the interest payments, okay, on the floaters. We've seen that before in previous LOS. So the floater is priced at 98 per 100 of par value. Calculate the discount margin for the floater, assued, assuming that the three-month Euribor is constant at 2%. Assume the 30, 360 day count convention and evenly spaced periods. Okay, we're just gonna work through this blue box ex example. So this is the example that I started on the PowerPoint slide, calculating the discount margin for a floating rate note. So you've got a four year French floating rate note, pays a three month Euribor, um, plus 1.25%. The floater's priced at 98 per 100 of par value. Calculate the discount margin for the floater. Assuming that the three-month Euribor is constant at 2%, assume the 300, uh, 30 divided by 360 day count. So we're going to jump into the solution here. So by assumption, uh, they're calculating the interest payment for each period is 0 0.08125 per 100 of par value. They're giving you a little bit of a formula here. But if I bring up my calculator, just an easy way to do it is 2% um, plus the uh, spread, okay? Uh, the 1.25 plus the spread of 2%. So that's 2 plus 1.25, okay? And what they're assuming is quarterly payments. So you divide by 4 and you're getting 0.1825, okay? So that's where that number comes from. It's just the 2 plus 1.25 divided by 4, okay? So the next thing that you need to do is that we're going to solve for the yield. That's basically what we're doing so that when we uh, scroll down here to get this point, um 009478 to get that yield, uh, the discount rate per period, we're going to solve for the R, okay? So we have to check our calculator, second PY, that we're in the quarterly mode. And this, this is gen, then just our basic time value of money calculation where we're gonna do 100 equals the future value. And it says here that it's a, a four years. So we're gonna do four, second, and N, okay? And we know the price of the bond is 98, so we're gonna make that a negative and hit that as our uh, present value. And then we know for our quarterly uh, payments, 0.8125, so 0.8125, we're gonna make that as our payment and we're gonna compute our IOI, okay? Now don't be shocked, that says 3.7912. Uh, what we need to do, because this is saying discount rate per period, we're gonna divide by four and it's 0 0.947808, okay? And that's in terms of a percentage. So if you hit that into a percentage, then you could see we've got the exact right answer there, R equals 0 0.009478. So if we just scroll up now, we can see that the discount margin therefore is 1.791% because we're gonna solve 0 0.009478 uh, equals 0 0.02 plus the DM divided by four, okay? So the quoted margin is 125 basis points over the Euribor reference rate. Using the simplified FRN pricing model, it is estimated that investors require 179.1 basis point spread for the floater to be priced at par value. Now, a little bit tough, and there is one uh, practice question based on that. Nevertheless, uh, I hope that helped you understand this blue box model on calculating the discount margin for a floating rate note. Now we're moving on to yield measures for money market instruments. There are several important differences in yield measures between the money market and the bond market. Number one, bond yields to maturity are annualized and compounded. Yield measures in the money market are annualized but not compounded. Instead, the rate of return on a money market instrument is stated on a simple interest basis. Number two, Bond yields to maturity can be calculated using standard time value of money analysis with formulas programmed into a financial calculator. Money market instruments are often quoted using non-standard interest rates and require 
different pricing equations than those used for bonds. And we'll see that in the next few slides, some of the pricing uh, equations. And finally, number three, bond yields to maturity usually are stated for common periodicity for all times to maturity. Money market instruments having different times to maturity have different periodicities for the annual rate. In general, quoted money market rates are either discount rates or add-on rates. Although market conventions vary around the world, commercial paper, treasury bills, and bankers' acceptance are often are quoted on a discount rate basis. Bank certificates of deposits, repos, and such indices as LIBOR and URIBOR are quoted on an add-on rate basis. It is important to understand that discount rate has a unique meaning in the money market. In general, discount rate means interest rate used to calculate a present value. For instance, market discount rate are used in this reading. So in the money market, however, discount rate is a specific type of quoted rate. So the pricing formula for money market instruments quoted on a discount rate basis is present value equals the future value times brackets one minus days over a year times the DR, which is the discount rate. And you need to be careful because you may use a 360 day or a 365 day year. Just jump into the ebook for a second here so you can see the equation there. Present value equals the future value times brackets one minus days over a year times the uh, DR, which is the discount rate stated as an annual percentage rate. So if we just slide this so we can see it in the middle, suppose that a 91 a uh, day U.S. Treasury bill with a face value of 10 million is quoted at a discount rate of 2.25 percent for an assumed 360 day year. So the um, the price of the T bill is 10 million times brackets one minus 91 over 360 times point that DR the discount rate 0 0.0225, and we're going to get the price of the T bill is 9,943,125. Okay. The pricing formula for money market instruments quoted on an add-on rate basis is present value equals future value divided by 1 minus the days over year times the AOR, which is the add-on rate. Okay, we'll just jump into the ebook again quickly so we can see here the uh, pricing formula for money market instruments quoted on an add-on rate basis. Present value equals the future value divided by 1 plus the days over number year times the add-on rate. So here, I'll just scroll down. We have a little bit of an example. Suppose that a Canadian pension fund buys a 180-day banker's acceptance with a quoted add-on rate of 4.38% for a 365-day year. If the initial principal amount is 10 million Canadian, the redemption amount due at maturity is found by rearranging the equation, okay? So you can see the future amount is the 10 million plus the 10 million times 180 over 365 times 0 0.0438. That's not too bad. Uh, uh, 10 million times 180 over 365 times uh, the rate for the year because that's the add-on rate that was quoted. And you get 10,216,000. Uh, but now we're going to scroll down a little bit and we can see we're going to use that uh, formula. It says that at maturity, the pension fund is going to receive 10,216,000, okay? Which is the 10 million plus the interest of 216,000. And uh, the interest is calculated as the principal times the fraction of the year times the annual add-on rate. So that's just a very interest, very easy interest uh, calculation, okay? So, but suppose that after 45 days, the pension fund sells the banker acceptance to a dealer. At the time, the quoted add-on rate for 135-day banker's acceptance is 4.17%. So now we can use that formula and the sale price for the banker's acceptance can be calculated. Uh, by doing the future value, 10,216,000 divided by 1 plus 135 days divided by 365 times the 0 0.0417 because that's the uh, quoted add-on rate. And we'll get 10,060,829, okay? So continuing with the money market yields, the characteristic of an add-on rate can be examined with the next equation, which transforms the pricing equation algebraically to isolate the add-on rate term. So remember the pricing equation when we're quoting in as an add-on rate is the present value equals the future value divided by one minus the days divided by year times the add-on rate, okay? So using the algebra, we can isolate the add-on rate equals 
year over days times future value minus present value divided by present value. So this converted rate is called a bond equivalent yield or sometimes just an investment yield. And a bond equivalent yield is a money market rate stated on a 365 day add-on rate basis. So let's do a practice question to check our understanding. A 365 day year bank certificate of deposit has an initial principal amount of 96.5 US dollar million and a redemption amount at maturity of 100 million. The number of days between settlement and maturity is 350. The bond equivalent yield is closest to A, 3.48%, B, 3.65%, or C, 3.78%. Okay, the correct answer is C, so recall that the bond equivalent yield is also called the add-on rate, and that's the formula that we needed to memorize. The add-on rate equals year over days times future value minus present value over present value. So the year is 365, and divided by 350, which gives us 1.04268 times 100 minus 96.5 divided by 96.5, which gives us 0 0.03627. So 1.04268 times 0 0.03627 gives us 0 0.03786, 3.786%, and that is closest to C, okay? So that's a, a formula that you need to memorize, and that is taking a 365 bank certificate of deposit and converting it into a bond equivalent yield. Okay, next we're just gonna look at two quick slides on yield to call when a bond is callable. And uh, one quick uh, practice question doing a calculation. So yield to call, a more precise yield measure is a for callable bonds. You would value the call option using a pricing model and expected yield volatility. You'd add the call option value to the bond price because again, callable bond is uh, at the right of the issuer. And you would calculate the option adjusted yield based on the option adjusted price. Okay, don't worry, there's, we don't need to do these calculations. Uh, for a puttable bond, you know that you subtract the value of the put option to get the option adjusted price. So here, can, carrying on with the uh, yield to call, so if we look at the yield to the uh, first call, substitute the call price at the first call date for par and the number of periods to the first call date for n and different yield to call for each of a bond's call dates and prices. Uh, yield to worst is the lowest of the yield to maturity and the yield to calls for all the call dates and prices. So that's the worst case scenario. You'll see with this practice question that the calculation is really easy actually. So a bond with a five years uh, remaining until maturity is currently trading at 101 per hundred of par value. The bond offers a 6% coupon rate with interest paid semi-annually. The bond is first callable in three years and is callable after that date on coupon dates according to the following schedule. So at the end of the th uh, year three, the call price is 102. At the end of year four, the call price is 101. And at the end of five years, of course, it's uh, the price is 100. It's par, the bond is uh, uh, maturing. So the bond's annual yield to second call is closest to A, 2.97%, B, 5.72%, or C, 5.94%. Okay, you can see that the yield to call is a very easy calculation, so it's to the second call, which is uh, four, uh, uh, at the end of year four, call price 101, so it's semi-annual, so we just need to check second PY, yet I'm set in that. So uh, it's the end of uh, year four, so that's four second NN, or N equals eight, okay. the um, the present value is going to be 101. I'm going to make that a negative. Our payment, it's a 6%, but it's semi-annual, so it's a 3 payment. And the future value is that call price at the end of year 4, so that's going to be a 101 future value. And we're going to just compute the IOI. We've got 5.94, so the correct answer is C. Over here, what I put is just the yield to maturity. Uh, if you were going to... Uh, um, uh, mature after five years, you'd see the yield to maturity on the bond is the 5.76, okay? So you can see calculating the yield to call is actually a very easy question. And we're just gonna finish this LOS with one last note on floating rate notes. And uh, this is important, we've seen this before. The coupon rate at the next reset date equals the reference rate at the previous reset date 
plus the quoted margin. Okay, we've seen that in a practice question before. That's very important to understand is that the coupon at the next reset date equals the reference rate at the previous reset date plus that quoted margin. So the required margin, the discount margin, is the margin that would cause the note's value to return to par at the reset date. And it may differ from the quoted margin if the issuer's credit quality changes. So if the required margin is greater than the quoted margin, the price is going to be less than par at the reset date. And if the required margin is less than the quoted margin, the price is going to be greater than par at the reset date. Well, what does that all mean? Let's look at a practice question to consolidate that understanding. So this is the last practice question for what has been a pretty long learning outcome statement. An analyst evaluates the following information relating to floating rate notes issued at par value that have three month LIBOR as the reference rate. So we've got three floating rate notes, X, Y, and Z, quoted margin and a discount margin. So for floating rate X, quoted margin 0.4%, discount margin 0.32%. Floating rate Y, quoted margin 0.45%, discount margin 0.45%. And for floating rate Z, quoted margin 0.55% and the discount margin 0.72%. So based only on the information provided, the FRN that will be priced at a premium on the next reset date is a, FRNX, B, FRNY, or C, FRNZ. Okay, nice little question to end on. A is correct. FRNX will be priced at a premium on the next reset date because the quoted margin of 0.4% is greater than the discount or required margin of 0.32%. So I highlighted there in bold and green, if the required margin is less than the quoted margin, the price is going to be greater than par at the reset and that is going to be priced at a premium. Okay, so that's been a long LOS and that's the last slide for this LOS. Thank you.